Think Tech Hawaii. Civil engagement lives here. Once again, ladies and gentlemen, this is Prince Dice here, the Prince of Investing. I'm coming to you guys live from the beautiful state of Denver, Colorado, even though this is being shot live here in uh, Honolulu, Hawaii. Uh, thank you guys for tuning in. If you're catching this on the playback on the podcast, the YouTube channel, or whatever the case may be, go ahead and hit that like, subscribe, comment, and share button. Drop comments if you got comments below. And uh, as always, I don't have a lot of time, and I definitely know you guys and girls don't have a lot of time, so we're going to jump straight into it. Now, the first thing I want you guys to know about this topic is a very touchy topic, and that I am not a CPA. I am not a CPA, and you should seek the advice from a CPA, which is a you know certified public accountant, charter uh, public accountant, pretty much, right? And the reason why I'm making that statement is that you know today's topic is going to be about tax evasion versus tax avoidance. Most most so, we're going to talk about tax avoidance, avoidance, right? Now, the thing, the, what, the reason why I bring this up is because I learned a lot about it, and I wanted to open you guys' mind about it, and so hopefully you can kind of look at your situations and find ways you can maybe possibly change your situation, right? Now, the first thing is tax avoidance is, you know, when I, heard, when I very first saw the word as I'm studying, I said, wow, tax avoidance, avoid taxes. That sounds like, you know, a bad thing to do. You know, the American way to be is to pay taxes, right, pay taxes to the government. But to be, in all actuality, it is actually a very smart thing to do to avoid taxes. And the government, um, the IRS has written, I want to say like a thousand pages or something like that, a, a bunch of pages in the IRS main that talks about ways to avoid taxes. And I want the reason why today I'm going to talk about that is I want to let you know some ways that you may be um, exposing yourself to more taxes or some ways that you can avoid taxes, not evade taxes, right? To avoid taxes with you coming down to investing and um, investing for your family, your kids, and things like that, that you can explore later. Now, I wanted some of my CPA buddies to come on, but, you know, I kind of came up with this topic kind of the last minute, and I didn't reach out to any of my CPA buddies, so uh, I may be reaching out to some of them to, to redo this episode to talk more in depth. But in this episode, I'm going to talk about uh, ways to reduce your taxable income, some ways we're going to talk about POP plans, premium outline plans, Roth IRAs, uh, tax shelters, uh, flexible spending accounts, defined contribution, pure taxable investments. It's going to be some cool stuff that you guys probably haven't heard of or seen before, so stay put. Now, the first thing is, to the more money you make, the more taxes you make, right? Theoretically, the more income you have, the more taxes you pay. Theoretically, right? But it breaks down to what type of income. We're talking about ways to reduce taxable income, to put you in a lower tax bracket so you can have less tax. For prime example, for most of the people that tune into this, um, you probably qualify for a Roth IRA or whatever the case may be. And what most people do, you work at, uh, let's say McDonald's. You work at McDonald's. You make your uh, you make your money at the end of the day. You pay taxes on it. You take home your thousand dollars a month or whatever it is. You take home your thousand dollars a month. You get smart and you say, hey, I want to start investing. So you log on to E-Trade, TD Ameritrade, Scott Trade, or maybe you may call a local broker, and they set you up with a brokerage account. You get a brokerage account, and now you buy Amazon stock in January. Amazon stock now is at all-time high, 18000 You decide to sell some shares, and because you made a couple thousand bucks, and as soon as you sell shares, now you have to pay capital gain tax of 15%. Now, you've pretty much got taxed twice. You got taxed before you got the money, then you made money on the money, and you paid tax again. Now, a smarter way to do that is, let's say if you uh, you earn your money from your job, you paid your tax, you earn your money from your job, then you go open up a Roth IRA account. Inside of that Roth IRA account, you can contribute up to $5,500 if you're up under, like, 55 years old or something. You take your $1,000, you put it inside of a Roth IRA, now you go and invest in Amazon. Amazon does great. You sell off the Amazon stock. Now you owe no capital tax, as long as you don't pull out on it before you're the age of, I think, 59 and a half, right? And when you do pull out on it, there's no taxes. There's no tax uh, on it. So for a prime example, you can see two ways that – the first person went out and um, got taxed twice versus someone else, uh, put their money into a Roth, made a small smidge of change just by opening up a different type of an account, 
and um, voila, they was able to pay different pay different taxes or whatever the case may be. So the thing about it is I want to talk about different ways to reduce your account. So you have things like uh, tax shelters that you hear people talk about, right? Like we just spoke about Roth IRAs. So a Roth IRA, what it does is instead of you paying money to the government and taxes to the government, you pay taxes to yourself, right? Now, define contributions. Most of you people may have a job. Most of you out there listening may have a job, which you may have a qualified 401k plan with your employer. That is considered a form of a tax shelter. And the reason why that's a tax shelter is because you can put money in there and you can defer your tax to a later date. You can put money in there and let your money grow, right? You put your money inside of a Roth IRA, or not a Roth IRA, you put your money inside of a traditional IRA that your employer offers, and you're not paying tax on that money. For a prime example, this is how it happens. You take money, for, let's say you, got, you make $40,000 a year. Excuse me about that, right? They got a little excited. You take $40,000 a year, right? And instead of, you know, usually you got to pay your taxes first. Let's say you pay $4,000 in tax. You're left with $36,000. Then you go off and you maybe invest some of it. But what a traditional Roth IRA does is you take, let's say if you make $4,000, $40,000, then you pay your $4,000, you put that into your IRA account. Now you only tax that $36,000. Now, granted, at the end, when it's time to take your money out, you're going to be taxed. But the thing is, you're letting your money grow with tax, and especially if you got a job that adds in contributions. So for first thing is, you're putting pre-tax dollars in there. You're not even paying tax on the money. You're throwing it into a 401k. Then if you have an employer that matches you, now you're getting the, the power. You're pretty much getting free money. And instead of paying the government taxes, you're letting your compound interest, you're letting that snowball get bigger, bigger, and bigger, and bigger, right? Because think about it. Let's take um, if you invested $2,000 a month and it compounded at 8%, and now you have a million dollars in about 18, 19 years, and it compounded 8%, and you invested $2,000 a month, right? $24,000 a year. Now, once you have that net egg saved up, now you have that million dollars, that million dollars is still compounded at 8%. Now you can set up and use a calculator, which me and my buddy did right before we came onto the show, and we were correct. You can withdraw about 90 some thousand dollars a year for 23 years on that money, right, before it runs out. Because that money is still compounding. That million dollars is still compounding. Even though you were drawing from it, it's still compounding, right? So when you think about it, that wasn't anything special. Well, Prince, where can I get 8%? S&P 500, we spoke about this. S&P 500, the last 124 years, uh, compounds at somewhere between 7 to 10% a year, right? You have those dividends reinvested. If you have it inside of a Roth IRA, it continues to grow, grow for you and grow for you and grow for you or whatever the case may be. But the reason why it's a limit on how much you can put inside of a Roth, because if I want a million dollars, I would just throw it inside of my uh, Roth IRA and avoid taxes. But another thing is premium-only plans, pop plans. Pop plans, this is money that's going to be set aside for your dental, your visual, your health, and things like that. Instead of you taking that money and then going out and paying for your medical and your, your own uh, visual, they take that money out of, they take that money before it's even reported to the IRS. So you can take that money and put it to the side of a POP account, and that's a way to reduce your uh, taxable income. Flexible income, right? Flexible income, or they call them flex cards, a flex account. They kind of have the same features of the, the POP account, but this is another way that people use the flexible spending accounts uh, using flex cards and things like that that people use to reduce their income. Another one, this is a very small one that I definitely want to share with you guys, something that uh, I learned, you know, recently was that let's say if you made a bunch of money one year, you made $100,000, $200,000 or whatever the case, you made a bunch of money in one year. Let's say if you were someone who invested in the General Electric. We all know over the past four years, General Electric hasn't been doing too hot, right? So you have that investment in your account that's sitting in the red. So if you're in a high tax bracket, you can sell that investment and you can sell that investment and take those capital losses to offset your income. And I think it's a limit on I think it's up to like three thousand dollars or something like that. I don't know the details. Like I said, I'm not gonna give out a whole bunch of details. I wanna throw some things out there for you guys to sit down with a CPA to go further with. So one of the things is like I said for my everybody's investment account, 
may have an investment not doing too hot. You may have that general electric that's sitting there that's you waiting to rebound that's not doing too hot. But if you are doing very good on your investments and you made a lot of money this year and you, you don't want to pay the IRS, not that you don't want to pay the IRS, you don't want to be liable to the IRS for a large income, one of some of the ways you can do, you can sell off some of your bad investments and then write that off as capital loss, right? Instead of just rebounding and, and paying at a higher tax bracket, whatever the case may be. So that's one that's called the pure, I think it's called uh, pure, not pure, but things. Taxable income on investments. That's something you can look into. Uh, another Other tax shelters that people look into, muni bonds. You pay attention to the show, you've seen a two time Super Bowl champion. Um, Eagles linebacker named Danny Elderby, he came on and he spoke about how he loves to invest in some muni bonds because they're pretty safe and that the interest you collect off of muni bonds are tax-free, right? So that's one of the ways that can be used as a tax shelter. You put your money into a muni bond, and a muni bond is essentially like local and state government, how they build highways, they borrow money from the public, and they pay you back at maybe 3 4 some pay up 5%. So usually you see a lot of wealthy people that are in high income brackets use muni bonds. You put your money in a muni bond, they pay you back tax free. That helps lower your uh, tax liability, right? Taxable income. Um, also, you have things like capital gains on homes, up to like five hundred thousand dollars for a married couple, up to two fifty on couples. To where if you purchase the home and you live in a home for two or three years and that home uh, appreciated in value. And let's say if you made two hundred fifty thousand, three hundred thousand dollars off of your house, you can use that as a, you know, you. That's a people look at that as a tax shelter because you don't have to pay money on that particular income. Um, another way is by placing money into things like five two nine college plans, placing things into. Uh, you have the five two nine college plans. You have you have uh, the Cordell savings account, savings fund, and you can put money to the side for your children and have your children uh, put money to the side for your children for the later date, which also lowers your income, your taxable income. Another thing that you always see wealthy people do, they always, always, always have charitable donations. They always have money that they're giving away to somebody or something or some type of cause or some type of organization, right? So you can make donations to your favorite foundation and write it off. Like if you go, you're a church goer and you pay 10% of your earnings, you can, um, your, your church or your religious organization should be giving you a, a form to help you um, be able to write off your taxes, right? So making contributions to uh, organizations, to nonprofit organizations, 501Cs, also you will see, I've seen where some people, they started foundations in their children's name, they donate the money to the, to the foundation, and the foundation in returns writes a check to the children, right? I have definitely seen that happen. And I thought that was pretty uh, clever, but, you know, but to me, it looks, let's say if I had, you know, my son Wesley, instead of just giving him money or whatever the case may be, I create a foundation for him, put him as a uh, president or whatever of the foundation, donate money to the foundation. That's a tax write-off for me. Then... Uh, have the foundation put my son on the pro payroll. I've seen very wealthy people do that to where I'm like, but to me it looks like a very, hey, wow, this guy giving all his money to charity. He hasn't given his son anything. He gives all his money to charity. That's what it looks like on paper. But in actuality, when you peel the layers back on the onion, you'd be like, wow, that's some pretty smart tax avoidance that this person is using. Other things I've seen people do where they started companies, they started LLCs, and they hired their children. They sort of LLCs where they may went out and purchased real estate or any type of company they may have wanted to start it, wanted to start, and they hire their children as employees of their own company. And then, you know, depending on their payroll, depending on the income, they can write off the income of the comp of the payroll inside of the tax. Uh, for prime example, you start a company called, like me, I call it Dykes Realty, real, real estate or whatever the case may be. I hired my son, Wesley, as an employee. I started this company. I go out and buy houses. Houses appreciate in value or whatever the case may be. My company's doing pretty well. Let's say I have my son on a payroll for $50,000 a year. 
as I'm paying him, you know, I can write off my payroll tax. I can write off what I'm giving my child as payroll tax and things like that. Now, I'm not going to get into the details. I don't know all the details in particular. I don't want anybody in the comment box or, hey, well, in the state of Illinois, it goes like this. In the state of California, I'm just giving you guys ideas and things that ways that people uh, uh, use tax avoidance techniques to lower their taxable income. And actually, the IRS don't frown upon tax avoidance. They frown upon tax evasion. What is tax evasion? Tax evasion is simple. It's illegal, and it's just not paying your taxes, not filing taxes, not paying your taxes, not uh, reporting your income. Let's say if you are a, uh, a stripper or you are a waiter or you are a, you're someone who make a lot of cash on hand. You make a bunch of money. The government is not going to know unless you report it. You don't report it, right? So if you don't report it, that's you just completely avoiding taxes. That's totally different from tax. Uh, that's, you, you're just completely evading taxes, right? You're just not even reporting it. You're not even talking about your income. Are you, you know, you made $100,000 this year doing concerts or whatever the case may be, and you turn around and don't tell the government about any of it. Or you tell the government that, hey, look, I made 20000 and the government puts you in a $20,000 bracket, bracket. Excuse me, I got the hiccups. But most people get caught because when someone writes you a check for that large amount, they're usually going to use a W-9 that they're going to report to the government, hey, I paid a particular person this much money for their services. Then the government is going to say, wow, this person said they paid $50,000 to Prince Dykes, but Prince Dykes only reported that he made $10,000. Either this person is over-reporting or this person is under-reporting. So if you do something like that, that's evading taxes. We're not talking about evading taxes. That's an illegal act. That's something that comes with jail time, fines. Ain't nobody got time for all that going to jail and stuff like that. We're talking about tax avoidance, ways that you can avoid tax or lower your taxable income, right? So there are ways that people put their kids, instead of giving out allowance, they put their kids on a payroll. They uh, start a company and hire their kids. They start foundations and hire their children. They use Roth IRAs. Um, they uh, open up a Roth maybe for their child, you know, or whatever the case can be. Now, the thing about it, the smartest way, the easiest way to com- to get, in- uh, not insurance, but the smartest way you can do is uh, insurance. Insurance is the easiest way to create generational wealth. <clears throat> With all the investing that I do, all the investing and learning and business ventures that I do and all of the stuff like that, one of the simplest ways is for me to go out there, get an insurance policy. If I croak over and die during this show, knowing that my wife and son is going to have a nice, pretty piece of change, right? That's a great thing to know. That's the simplest way. But now, granted, I'm not you know, deterring anybody or saying that, hey, don't go out here and start a business or do business ventures, because that's ways that can add on to your uh, – those are things that can add on to your – um, your legacy and to your wealth that you pass down to your kids. So that's one thing I want you guys to think about as well. I don't want to ramble off the topic or whatnot, but those are some ways that people use. You know, they look at their, oh, I forgot about something. another big one, deterring, deterring your income. Some people deter, or def- what I'm talking about deterring, I mean defer, deferring your income. For prime example, let's say if you're a barber or you're a hairstylist and you know you made a lot of money this year. Uh, some people defer their income. They say, well, I made a lot of money this year, but I don't plan on making this much money next year because I'm going back to school or uh, I'm going to be working part-time. So instead of taking their payments during in December, they'll take them in January. Instead of taking, hey, uh, reporting the income in December, they're reporting in January, which they are deferring their income to where they could be in a lower tax bracket. For prime example, most people won't make as much money in retirement as they will throughout their life, right? So with me, for prime example, um, you know, let's take me for a prime example. You know, I may not make as much money as I'm making now in my retired life. So some people will say, hey, I want to defer my income tax to where I think I'm going to be in a lower tax bracket where I'm not going to make as much money. I did also this year. I sold a bunch of books. I've got a hundred thousand dollars in you know book sales, but the case may be I want to turn around and I have one more client that wants to buy two thousand um, two thousand books from me, 
instead of me charging him in December, I may charge him in January or February because I want to defer my income to another year or whatever the case may be. But it's all type of ways people do that. But just know that people defer their income. Some people um, have tax shelters where they defer their income to a later date. That's what a traditional or regular IRA is, right? If you contribute your money to it, you're going to be paying at a later date. You're not going to be paying at this date. You're going to be paying at a later date and when you're you know, 50 or 60 years old, right? You're not paying in taxes now, but you're using the government's money and you're using uh, matching to build up your nest egg, and you're going to pay your taxes at a later date. That's deferring your taxes, right? So the same way you defer your tax, you can defer your income. So those are big things. Tax avoidance is a good thing that's very smart business people do. Tax evasion is a very bad thing that people do that's illegal and that you can get time for. So in this show, we're talking about tax avoidance. Like, as always, I told you guys, this is a disclaimer. I am not a CPA, nor do I desire to be a CPA. I'm just here to open up your brain and expand your brain to thinking about something different to say, hmm, am I using the best tax strategies for my investment? Hey, instead of paying this money to taxes, I can contribute to my Roth IRA. Hmm, I do have a pop plan at my job. I do have an FSA plan. Let me look into that. Instead of paying this tax, you know, put myself in a higher tax bracket, maybe I can up my contribution. Maybe I can start a business for my children. Maybe I can start contributing to a 529 plan. I can start contributing to different qualified plans that will lower my income, and I'm investing for my children. Instead of giving it to the government, you're giving it to yourself. But the government had different ways, you know, where they tax capital gains at a lower tax rate to uh, – induce people to invest more, right? So those are the things I want you guys to think about. I don't want to get into it too far and too deep, but those are some ways you can avoid tax, uh, use tax avoidance strategies versus tax uh, tax uh, evasion, right? You don't want to do that. So the thing about it is see a CPA, not your cousins, not your friends, not blah, 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 who, hey, you know, I do taxes and I can file your tax for you. I'm not saying anything is wrong with those people, but use a covenant CPA um, person um, or whatever the case may be. Someone who's listening to this, they do taxes and they say, well, you can refer them to me. Um, you should go back or go to school and try to get that CPA uh, certification or whatnot. Not saying that you're even better. It's just like any other license. Doesn't mean that you're better, doesn't mean that you're the best, but it means that you at least have a basic understanding between right and wrong and that you're held to some uh, certain type of standards. All right? So that's going to wrap up today's show. Thank you guys for uh, tuning in. Um, don't forget to hit that like, subscribe, comment, and share button. If you, want to, if you like what we do, you want to support our projects, um, check out Wesley Learns to Invest, Wesley Learns About Credit. Uh, check out our Wesley Learns line. But as always, I don't have a lot of time. I definitely know you guys and girls don't have a lot of time. So uh, until the next video, podcast, whatever else you see me do crazy around the globe, peace, be safe. I'm out, and thank you.